Welcome in everyone, ready to dive deep. Always, let's do it. Today, we're tackling something we, well, we do all the time without even thinking, language. The very stuff of thought. And to help us unpack it all, we've got an expert in, get this, B.F. Skinner's work on verbal behavior. Happy to be here. Skinner. Now there's a name that makes you think, right? Oh, absolutely, a giant in the field. It really changed how we see things. So to guide our deep dive, we're looking at this chapter really digs into his perspective. It's a fascinating one, that's for sure. Gets the core of what makes us human. I gotta admit, first skim through, I was like, whoa, dense stuff. But yeah, then- happens to the best of us. But then it clicked, you know? It's like a whole new way of looking at something we just, we take for granted. It's a real shift, yeah. <laughs> See, for ages, linguists were all about the listener, right? Right. How do our brains decode grammar, syntax? The mechanics of it all. Exactly. But Skinner, he flipped the script. He wanted to know what makes us, the speakers, actually open our mouths in the first place. So instead of how do we understand, it's why do we even bother? In a nutshell, yeah. He said language, just like any other behavior, it's all about what comes after we speak, the consequences. We learn because it works. Right. It gets us what we need, helps us avoid the bad stuff, lets us connect with people. Okay, so like, I'm craving cookies. I say, cookie please magically cookie appears there you go yeah. positive reinforcement makes you want to say those words again exactly and that brings us to skinner's mand basically any request driven by what you want like your cookie craving but it's got to be more than just basic needs right oh absolutely asking a question that's a man for info cracking a joke man for laughter so even just like good morning is a kind of man. Think about it. You're looking for a friendly response, a little connection there. Wow. It's wild to think about everyday talk like that. It really is. And this is where it gets super relevant, especially for parents, teachers, anyone who works with kids. Okay. I'm all ears. How so? Well, picture this. Kids throwing a tantrum. Wants a toy. Right. Seems like it's about the toy itself. Right. Classic meltdown. But what if, underneath, it's a man for attention? Or maybe control. Choosing what they play with. So you're not just reacting to the outburst, you're like decoding the message behind it. Exactly. And knowing that can totally change how you handle things. Maybe comfort instead of giving in or offering choices instead of commands. Fascinating. Now, speaking of different ways we communicate, there's this distinction Skinner made really caught my eye. Topography versus selection. Ah, yes. Gets to the heart of how we use symbols. And this is where little Jason comes in, right? Yep. From the chapter, the boy who wasn't speaking. Exactly. Jason's story really shows how understanding this can be life-changing for folks with language delays. So break it down for us. What's the difference between how we talk in terms of, what was it, topography and selection? Good question. Topography is the form of communication. The sounds, the signs, the written words themselves. Selection, though. The what versus the how. You got it. Selection is about picking the right symbol from all the ones you could use. It's conveying meaning through choice. So me, belting out karaoke, all topography, baby. Yeah. But writing an email? That's selection central. Gotta pick the right words. Perfect examples. And for someone like Jason, who wasn't using spoken words at all, yeah. focusing on selection, on choosing symbols to get his needs met, that was the key. That's where his therapist started, right, with sign language. Right. And they started with signs for things he really wanted. Toys, treats, activities. Gotta have that motivation. Yeah. Exactly. And they made sure to pair those signs with the actual objects so he could connect the symbol to the real thing. And as he started using those signs more and more, something pretty amazing happened, didn't it? It's like those signs, they weren't just signs, you know, they're like keys unlocking something bigger. Exactly. He started like imitating sounds and then... Boom, he's talking. It's incredible, right? Shows how powerful this idea of selection, of making choices to communicate, can be. It's like opening up this whole new channel in the brain just from learning to choose. And it highlights something crucial about how we learn any language. It's not like one thing at a time. Our brains are constantly making these, these connections, building on what we already know. Which brings us to like the heart of it all, generative learning. You know that phase? Kids suddenly know a zillion words. Language explosion. <laughs> right. It's not magic, though it seems like it. Not magic, but fascinating. Skinner had a couple of big ideas about this, right? Yeah, he did. One is stimulus equivalence. Yeah. Big word, but the idea is you learn one thing. And it's like dominoes, all these other things fall into place. Exactly. Like you teach a kid dog. Suddenly it's puppy, tail, bark, 
Never even explicitly taught those words. The brain just like figures it out, makes those links on its own. Exactly. Like it's hardwired for efficiency when it comes to language. Yeah. If we had to learn each word in isolation. We'd never shut up. <laughs> just be babbling our first word forever. Huh. Right. There'd be no talking. Just yeah. single word utterances for life. But generative learning, it's about building like a framework. Okay. So it's more like you learn dog. Yeah. That's one brick. But then you learn what dogs do, what they're related to. You're building a whole dog house of knowledge. Yeah. And that applies to, well, everything. So it's not just more words. It's how they all fit together, which reminds me another one of those aha moments. Bidirectional naming. Ah, yes. Gets to the heart of how understanding and speaking are, well, two sides of the same coin. Explain that one. Sounds kind of zen. A little bit. Yeah. So once a kid learns a word, they can use it to label something but also to understand when someone else uses it. Incoming, outgoing, same word, different directions, but it means the same in their head. Exactly. That bi-directional thing, that's what lets us have real conversations. Mm. Share ideas back and forth, build on what the other person's saying. Otherwise, it's just two people with dictionaries, no real communication. Exactly. Bi-directional naming, it's the foundation of it all. Man, this is making me realize there's so much happening under the hood every time we talk. It's mind-blowing. And we've mostly been talking about the speaker so far, right? But it takes two to tango. What about the listener? Ah, good point. Skinner. He was adamant that listening isn't passive. It's an active process. Our brains working hard to make sense of those sounds hitting our ears. It's true. We're not just tape recorders soaking it all in. We're interpreting, predicting, like microanalyzing every word. Absolutely. And just like anything else, listening it takes practice to get good at it. Think about little kids, right? Learning cat versus hat or, oh, can and can't. One tiny sound difference, whole different meaning. Huge difference. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about individual sounds either. It's about grasping the tone, the context. The subtle stuff. Like if I say, oh, that's great. Am I being sincere or sarcastic? Exactly. Listeners, they have to decode all that. It's impressive when you think about it. Makes you realize how amazing our brains are, even without us realizing it. But then that makes me wonder, how do we learn to express those nuances ourselves? The doubt, the certainty, the emotions, how do those get put into words? Now that is a fantastic question, and it leads us to one of Skinner's most intriguing ideas, the concept yeah. of autoclitics. Auto what now? Okay, I'll be honest, that one kind of went over my head at first. It's a mouthful, yeah. yeah. Basically, these are words or phrases that show we're aware of our own speech. Like we're commenting on it as we go. Give me an example. I got to hear this in action. Okay. Say you're telling me about a movie. You might say, I think it came out last year or it was really good. You have to see it. The emphasis, right? It's like you're adding your own little side notes to the main story. Exactly. Those little additions, those are autoclitics. Think really have in those sentences. They add a whole other layer of meaning. So it's like we're giving the listener a window into our thought process, even if we don't mean to. Precisely. And that's what makes them so fascinating. They reveal how much goes on beneath the surface of even the simplest sentence. So much for language being straightforward, huh? Okay, but here's the thought. What happens when that ability to, like, think about our thinking, to put it into words? What if that starts to go? It's like those little glimpses into how our minds work, they start to fade. It's a tough thing to face, for sure. And sadly, it's something that can happen, you know, as we get older or if certain health issues come up. Exactly. It's heartbreaking, really. Like yeah. with dementia, right? When someone struggles to find the right words or to really express themselves. It's incredibly difficult, yeah, both for the person going through it and everyone around them. You feel so helpless, I imagine. You do. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. Even though it seems like a completely different issue from, say, a child learning to speak. Okay, I'm following. How so? Well, Skinner's framework it actually gives us some helpful ways to think about language loss, too. Really? That's kind of surprising you wouldn't think so at first. Right. But remember how we talked about language being learned shaped by what happens afterwards? The whole reinforcement thing, yeah. We do more of what works. Exactly. So if someone's having trouble communicating and those consequences change, become less consistent. It's like the behavior itself gets weaker. Exactly. If you're not getting the response you used to, what's the point of trying so hard, right? Yeah. So you might start to avoid conversations, withdraw a little. And the less you use those language skills, the rustier they get. Sadly, that's often what happens. It's a vicious cycle. Which is where I'm guessing caregivers and loved ones come in, trying to keep those connections strong. Absolutely. 
and it can be so, so challenging. But here's the encouraging part, the part that always gives me hope. Okay, I need some hope here. Lay it on me. Skinner's view, it means language loss isn't always a one-way street. It's not like once it's gone, it's gone. So there's potential to like turn things around. There can be. The chapter talks about how his analysis, it can actually help guide those assessments, those interventions for folks with language impairments, even later in life. So you're figuring out like what's working, what's not, what parts of language are breaking down. Exactly. And, and then you tailor the help to those specific areas. It's like instead of just saying, oh, they're losing language, you pinpoint what is weakening. OK, I'm picturing like a tailor, right, yeah. taking precise measurements to see where things need adjusting. Love that analogy. And you know, it's fascinating. A lot of the techniques used, they're surprisingly similar to what you do with a young child learning to talk. Really? So it's all about tapping into that motivation no matter how old you are. It is. Clear prompts, consistent reinforcement, mm. those core principles, they apply across the lifespan. That's powerful stuff. It really drives home that this whole behavioral approach, it's not just theory, it's about real life help. Exactly. Understanding the mechanics of language is one thing, but using it to make a difference, to support people, that's where it gets truly exciting. No doubt about it. Well, we've covered a ton today, from those first baby babbles all the way to how our thoughts work, even the potential for language to fade and maybe come back. It's a testament to how fundamental language is, right? Yeah. To everything we do. Absolutely. And all starting with Skinner's idea, language, it's behavior which means we can study it, we can understand it, and ultimately... We can influence it. For the better, hopefully. Exactly. Now, before we wrap up, and maybe this is me still stuck on those autoclitics, but... Always happy to geek out about language. Yeah, watch. Check out. Out. If our thoughts are really just, like, silent conversations we're having with ourselves, what does that say about consciousness? About what it means to be aware? Whoa, that's a big one. Philosophers have been debating that for centuries, and Skinner's work, it throws a whole new wrench into the mix. Right. It makes you think, if we could somehow listen in on those silent conversations, what would we learn about ourselves? The mysteries of the human mind. But that's the beauty of this whole field, isn't it? Skinner didn't just give us answers, he opened up a whole new world of questions. Couldn't have said it better myself. My to-read list just got a whole lot longer, that's for sure. But hey, to our listeners, thanks for joining us on this deep dive into B.F. Skinner's world. It's been a wild ride. A pleasure being here. Always love a good language debate. Keep those questions coming. Keep those conversations going. And we'll catch you next time for another deep dive.